you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Hosea, Hosea chapter 3, it's probably back in that section where the pages are still all white and un- unwrinkled. Hosea chapter 3, and if you're using the Bibles that are under the seats, you can find it on page 752, page 752, we're looking at Hosea chapter 3, the entire lengthy chapter this morning, Hosea chapter 3. Now let's hear what the Lord will say to us in His holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Hosea 3, 1 through 5. And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and letic of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to His goodness in the latter days. And so may the Lord add His incredibly rich blessing to the reading and to the hearing of His Holy Word. Shall we pray together? O glorious and exalted Father, blessed Son, and precious and abiding Holy Spirit, three persons dwelling eternally in the unity of the Godhead. O Lord, we would ask that You would show us today just how wonderfully that we have been reclaimed from sin and bondage, from our futile way of life, a life that was lived outside of Christ and outside of His kingdom. May you grant the word of the Lord from this passage today to have great success in these moments and even beyond as the truth the truth about your work of saving and reclaiming people who are lost in sin, as that finds entrance in hearts even today as they are changed by your renewing power. And so may our love for Christ deepen. May it expand from our pondering the great work of redemption. And may we seek the Lord. May we seek His goodness. And may we seek David our King, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, all of our days. For it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. The movie Mommy Dearest that is over 40 years old now um, is purportedly a uh, depiction of the life of Hollywood icon Joan Crawford. And it's based on the book by her adopted daughter, Christina. Now, many dispute how accurate it is and claim that she really wasn't like it. I have no idea. Joan Crawford would not marry, but she wanted, and she actually did, adopt children, several children. And uh, in her day, the easy way to do that was by adoption. Um, And what she planned to do was raise them as uh, to be model adults that were surrounded by really everything that was best that life had to offer that she could give to them. She had wealth, she had power, she had influence, and she wanted to pass that on to her children. According to her daughter's account, though, uh, Crawford's parenting skills were 
shall we say, just less than stellar. They were abusive and harsh, according to her daughter. And her two adopted children ended up being um, neurotic and feeling unloved. There's this one moving uh, scene, very dramatic in the picture, uh, motion picture, where um, Joan Crawford and her adolescent daughter had a, an explosive, violent altercation. Um, and, you know, at the apex of that fight that they had, her daughter just cries out in despair, you know, why did you adopt me? Joan Crawford is just stunned. Didn't expect to hear that, certainly from her daughter. And she paused her ranting and her raving for just a moment. It's like she had to think about it. Why did she adopt her children? And the only thing she could utter was that she had raised, she wanted to raise children with the things that she never had. And Christina, her daughter, she's just overcome with anger. And she, she retorts something to effect, you only wanted another trophy in your case. Now, Joan Crawford may have begun motherhood with very good intentions and her plans being noble and wanting to, to raise children that were, were contributing members of society, but somewhere along the, along the way, those intentions seem to have got off track. They went awry, and her plans didn't work out the way that she had hoped. And we know that as humans, we can start out with great plans. We do all the planning and all the scripting for a particular course of action, but plans can easily and sometimes very quickly go awry and astray. But this is never the case with Almighty God. His plans always come to pass. Nothing happens apart from His all-comprehensive, uh, all-loving design. Now, we're looking at a time in which Israel, the northern tribes, would play the harlot. They would be spiritual adulterers and adulteresses. That was no uh, surprise to God. That did not throw his plans off. Israel would go into bondage because of it. Again, that was no surprise to God. He brought it to pass. Israel would, though, be reclaimed. They would be restored and remarried to God. And that would be a surprise. Not to God. It would be a surprise to Israel. And God had a purpose in all of it. And it's a purpose that reaches down even to this very moment where we are right now. So as we're reading Hosea, as we're studying it, it's not just ancient history. Hosea is speaking to us because the Spirit of God is speaking through Hosea to us. We see the, the wonderful promises. You know, I, I, I've been asked several times, why Hosea? Why are we going through Hosea? And that's a, that's a valid question. Uh, number one, I'd say, well, why not? Why not go through Hosea? It's, it's, though it's a book that I've really always wanted to, to go through. It's, it's just full of, it's full of Hebrew poetry, which can be, it can be a tough read. And there's difficult language in this book. But in many ways, Hosea is the one that really kind of kicks off the, um, the, the Lord speaking in a, in a way that he did through this downward slide of, of Israel. Um, some think Joel may have been prior to Hosea. We're not really exactly sure where Hosea fits in chronologically, but many would say Hosea was very early, middle 8th century. So he kicks it off. And we're seeing what God is doing in relationship to a people who essentially have thrown him aside, their husband, their covenant God, and how the Lord reacts to that. We see amazing, incredible things about our God. Uh, the, chapter 3 is a short chapter, but there's a lot in it. And I think you'll see that. First, in verse 1, we notice that Hosea records the Lord's command for Hosea to reunite with his former wife. God gives Hosea command to reunite with his former wife. He is going to remarry Gomer. This is not another um, 
adulterous woman. Some have suggested that Hosea is marrying uh, another lady other than Gomer. Uh, but the language, the literary connection of these first three chapters, and especially the analogy that we're going to see that God himself draws, the analogy between God and Israel speaks very forcibly against this interpretation. This is Gomer. And we saw in the chapter previously that Hosea separated or divorced Gomer for her uh, adultery. And notice the word go in this verse. That's the usual word in Scripture for taking in marriage. Uh, and in this case, it would be a remarriage. But in the last part of verse 1, here we see that this action of Gomer now reuniting with his wife, his ex-wife, it pictures God's love for Israel. Last part of verse 1, we get the reason uh, for this reconciliation. Notice, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. That seems, why, why did they throw in cakes of raisins there? Uh, that seemed to be, you know, other gods, cakes of raisins, uh, what's going on here? Well, um, you know, Israel had committed spiritual adultery with other deities, and yet the Lord still loved them. That, that's amazing. And the inclusion of raisin cakes as along with the other gods as an object of as was love, probably points to a very prominent aspect of the worship of the Baals that they were engaged in. We saw that uh, Gomer's father, his, his name meant raisin cake, although this is a different word here that is used. Um, but uh, some suggest that these also were uh, used in the very debauched uh, sexual rituals that would, that would be uh, used in Baal worship uh, and even like an aphrodisiac of sorts. Notice that Hosea obeys the Lord and then in, in verses 2 and 3, we find Hosea has conditions for his wife after their reunion. Hosea's conditions are seen in verses 2 and 3. Notice there's a cost here that Hosea incurs. He buys Gomer, and we're given the price, 15 shekels of silver and a homer. That's about six bushels. If you've never been told to go into the garden and pick uh, you know, tomatoes or peaches or, or whatever, a bushel basket probably doesn't seem much. It's, it's a pretty good size. So there's uh, a homer's about six bushels. And then a letek, that's half of a homer or about three bushels. So we're talking nine bushels of barley. So that was, that was considered very valuable. Um, now we know that a typical price for a slave or an indentured servant was uh, 30 shekels of silver. And so this is likely telling us that Gomer, had got, life had gotten so bad for her after her divorce from Hosea, that she had to become um, a slave in order to survive, an indentured servant. And Hosea pays the price. This was the debt of her service. And the price would have either been the full amount of her redemption until the year of release, uh, however long it was, till that seventh year. Uh, but likely Israel wasn't paying much attention to that. Uh, stipulation of the law of Moses. So probably here is just a, a flat, flat price to reclaim Gomer. But either way, Gomer had to go into bondage. Now in verse 3, Hosea is defining, making very clear that even though these conditions that he's going to place, and we're going to see them, um, he still, she still now is his wife. She is, he is her husband. So after reclaiming her, what we find is Hosea is restricting her activities. He imposes upon her a period of um, uh, moral and physical isolation, a, 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 a time of purification of sorts. 
And he makes her status clear in verse 3. You shall dwell as mine many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. So Gomer will again be Hosea's wife, but she will be restricted. She will have no physical relations with anyone, Hosea included. The Hebrew at the end of verse 3, uh, it's been variously interpreted. Actually, the New Living Translation, which is really not a translation, uh, it's a paraphrase, uh, but it actually catches the sense of what uh, the text is saying here quite well. It renders it this way. You must live in my house for many days. Stop your prostitution. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone, not even with me. So Hosea is restricting Gomer. Now, this isn't a matter of vindictiveness. He's not trying to show her who's boss. This arrangement is, um, is designed to picture God's plan for Israel after he reclaims Israel. And so in verses 4 and 5, we have now the explanation for God's plan in reclaiming Israel. The explanation for God's plan for reclaiming Israel. Now there are three prominent ideas here, three prominent things that God says. And the first one is in verse 4. Israel will exist for a time, considerable time, without political or without religious leadership. You'll go through a time of not having either civil, political, or spiritual, religious leadership. This time without notice, king or prince without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household God. So what you have here in this list are both um, legitimate and illegitimate uh, means that characterized at this point at least their national identity. They will be without the means of grace. No sacrifice for drawing near to God, for obtaining His forgiveness. Now we know that the sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats, had no efficacy on their own to ever forgive sins. But at the time, this was God's appointed means by which it was communicated. True divine forgiveness was communicated through these uh, bulls and goats. I was reading through Leviticus recently. Yes, Leviticus. <laughs> uh, it's interesting that those sacrifices actually say that when they were brought, they would receive forgiveness. Now, of course, it all points, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, it points to the true efficacious means, which is none other than the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They will have no ephod. They're, the, the ephod was a means for obtaining divine guidance. Gone. They wouldn't have that. Household gods or the teraphim. Um, now these were the illegitimate means for obtaining uh, divine guidance. There would, there would not be pillars, no impurities uh, that were often associated. You know, uh, false worship went hand in hand with these pillars that were erected. That's going to be gone too. So there will be a time of no political or religious leadership. And then the first part of verse 5 speaks of a time afterward that Israel will seek the Lord and His Messiah. Chapter 1. Remember? We saw that in, in, in behind all of that, um, the names of those children and what they portended for Israel, there was going to be a blessing. That there would come a time, they would be gathered under one head. Now what verse 5 says, first part here is expanding on that promise. The king here is the great son of David, and that certainly echoes the Lord's wonderful promise to the house of David in 2 Samuel 7. So Israel will see, there will be a time after this period of isolation, if you will, that Israel will seek the Lord, truly seek the Lord and His Messiah. 
And then thirdly, last part of verse 5, Israel will actually come to a place where they will be filled with awe for the Lord. It's not going to just be rote and ritualistic and go through the motions. The Lord, the Lord will fill Israel with true awe, reverence, fear, trembling for the Lord. Notice they will come with fear to the Lord and His goodness in the latter days. And that word fear uh, can mean trembling, but it doesn't necessarily mean being scared or coming in dread of what will happen. The idea is coming with great awe. This is the Lord. Let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. Awe that impacts and that makes one um, perhaps literally weak in the knees. In the latter days, that's the Old Testament equivalent of the last days that the New Testament speaks about, time after the coming of Messiah. Now, the Old Testament views this as a time of after the return from the exile, after being restored to their land. So this text has, says a lot. And again, you have this analogy, this parallel of what ha- is happening with Hosea and his relationship with his wife as it pictures God's relationship with faithless Israel. Now, there's a key concept that's, that's buried. Maybe it's not buried, but it's, it's, it's clearly embedded in this text. Again, there was a cost that was incurred by Hosea in order to reclaim his ex-wife. Her sinful ways had... Um, enslaved her. And so Hosea had to pay a price in order for her to be released, to be free. Couldn't just waltz up to the person who um, had acquired her and say, come on, dear, we're going home. (laughs) There was a cost that had to be rendered, had to be paid. And when we think also about our situation. We know that for our redemption, for our salvation, there was a cost. There was a redemption price that had to be paid to reclaim us. Our redemption came at the high price of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see everything in Scripture points to that, to that cost, to that price. From the very moment that the Lord God took animal skins and put it on our first parents. Now, this cost was not something that had to be paid as a ransom to Satan. As if God was in his debt and had to satisfy the devil before we could be freed. Now, that was a view that was very popular in the early church in order to explain the atonement or the the sacrifice that Jesus secured for us as people, that there was a cost, the price had to be paid to Satan because he had title. Man had forfeited, and it went over to the devil. But the debt that we owe is not to Satan. The debt we owe is to God. It's to His violated and offended righteousness and His justice. Everyone has a debt to God. Everyone. Everyone is a slave. Every single person who has ever lived owes an incredible debt to God, a debt that no one can pay off. And so to remarry, Jose had to pay this. Again, the immoralities of Gomer had landed her in bondage. And the only reasonable way that she could survive, obviously, was to attach herself in some capacity to someone who then had the right to 
basically dictate her life for whatever period of time that she was in his service. I would suspect that none of us here today, at least I would hope none of us have ever experienced anything like this. That we do not know what it's like to be completely controlled by someone else. At least not what it was like in the ancient system in, in Israel. You know, we often complain that our life is controlled by other people, whether it's our boss or um, maybe our, our, our kids or our spouse or our, uh, our job. I mean, you name it, fill in the blank. We often feel, feel as if we are being controlled by outside forces. And of course, our normal obligations do impose responsibilities upon all of us that obligate us, that we have entered into willingly that tie us down, so to speak. But it's a far cry from the situation that Gomer faced. It's a far cry from what is in the spiritual realm when we're in bondage to sin. Jesus said, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. And so when we realize the cost of being free, and I mean truly spiritually free, liberated, I mean the enormity of that debt and the cost and what it's accomplished, what Christ did for us. I mean, how can our gratitude and our love for Him, how can that not just skyrocket off the charts? Remember the story of the sinful woman in Luke chapter 7? Came to the house of the Pharisee to anoint Jesus with a very expensive jar of alabaster. Now, it wasn't uncommon for in the outer area of a home for people in the community to, to come, uh, not into the inner recesses of the home, obviously. And so when Jesus was a guest at the home of this Pharisee, this sinful woman, which meant she was publicly, notoriously sinful, probably a promiscuous woman, just as Gomer was. And she knew the enormity of her sin, and she knew Jesus was there. The Pharisee saw what she did in taking all this expensive ointment and anointing Jesus, wiping his feet with her hair. And he was just incensed. Jesus called himself a prophet. Well, if you were a prophet, you would know who this woman was. She's a sinful woman. And then that prompted our Lord to utter a parable, to a story about two debtors, one basically owing ten times more than the other, both big, huge, incredible, non-payable debts, but one was significantly greater in a real sense. The debt that was owed to God. This Pharisee didn't understand Simon. He couldn't pay it either. Now we realize there are degrees of sin. There, some sins are just more heinous than others. Judas who betrayed Christ, he had the greater sin. So we recognize there are degrees and levels, if you will, and certainly sins that are not expressed are not greater in, the, in terms of the consequences and the damages that they, uh, that they incur. But let's, let's get real. Every sin, any sin, no matter how small, think of, think of eating an apple that was you were told not to. I say apple, we don't know it was an apple. Some sort of fruit, some sort of... Ed edible treat from a tree. Just eating that caused an infinite separation between our first parents and Almighty God. 
any forgiveness that this Pharisee thought that he needed couldn't be that big, couldn't be that monumental. I mean, look at this. Compared to her, he was a pretty good guy. And yet Jesus told this parable so he would understand the cost for your small in comparison sin is just as enormous. This woman understands it caused her to truly have a great love for her Lord from her heart. Have you ever thought about how much forgiveness you need in your life? How much forgiveness do I need? I calculate it out. Well, compared to so-and-so, I actually am doing pretty well. I don't really use up the grace. You know, the Lord has to expend so much grace on me as He does on you know, you know who. Yes, I need forgiveness. I've sinned. I've sinned. But whew, wow, I, the Lord was actually doing a pretty good thing when He forgave me. Christ paid the debt on the cross. And we all need to understand we had a debt that required the cost of the death of the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Christ paid that debt. So understand this. If you look at your life and you... If you're really honest and you see that your love and your obedience to Christ, if it's slight, if it's small, you know, if it's occasional, you need to understand that you're failing to grasp how much you have been forgiven by God. He who senses he's been forgiven little loves Little. We understand how much we've been forgiven. We love much. But of course, let's not lose sight of the redemptive historical point of this passage. Hosea's domestic situation, again, it's a picture, it's an analogy, serves as the backdrop for the Lord God reclaiming Israel after they've been exiled for their spiritual adultery and their infidelity to the Lord. As a covenant people, they were married, as it were, to God. But they played the harlot with many lovers, with many nations, they're gods of the nations. And the Lord God would banish them. You know, the New Testament, and Paul in particular, he alludes to Hosea. And the way they apply Hosea's prophecy is quite, quite interesting in a redemptive historical manner, which we have to truly understand. Because we are in that redemptive historical um, atmosphere. We're in that milieu. New Testament, particularly in Romans 11, it shows us that the word of the Lord through Hosea, is, it is being fulfilled in the latter days, which we understand from the New Testament revelation that these days, the latter days, the last days, the days in which we are now living. It's right here. They're here. This is the last days. And the reclamation of Israel. This, once again, with the, the three things that, that uh, God explained through Hosea. Coming with awe. Seeking the Lord their God. It's being fulfilled. And it involves not just ethnic Jews, but Gentiles also. That's how the writers of the New Testament understand the prophecies of Hosea. It goes beyond ethnic Israel. It includes them, but goes beyond. And so in this gospel age, through the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, we see that people in every nation, men, women, and children, are returning to the Lord God. They're turning to Him. 
They're seeking the Lord, seeking David their king. This is the gospel age. Of course, David the, their king, David our king, is the great son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And when you go to Romans chapter 11, you look especially at verses 25 through 36, which we've read earlier, and um, it informs us there that God is still calling uh, ethnic Jews into his kingdom, into his church, even though uh, at the present time we're told there is a, a partial hardening that envelops Israel. Gentiles are streaming into the kingdom of God. And verses 25 and 26 of Romans 11, those are some difficult um, verses to interpret and just to nail down exactly who the all Israel that will be saved is. One view is that it's a future generation of ethnic national Jews who just prior to the return of Christ will so turn to the Lord that in terms of uh, the numbers, all Israel can be said to be saved. A second view is that it refers to the full number of the elect of both ethnic Jews and Gentiles from the beginning to the second coming of Christ. Everyone, all Israel, all the, all the saints of God. And a third view is the total number of just ethnic Jews of all ages who come to Christ until the second coming of the Lord. Uh, obviously, we, we don't have time to dive into this very fascinating question, but regardless of the view that you take, that phrase, all Israel, in some sense tells us that returning and seeking the Lord their God, David their king, coming with fear, that is taking place even now. The Lord is calling out His people in every place. And so what this means, and Paul applies this whole thing in Romans 12, that we are to live, having our minds renewed, offering our bodies as living sacrifices, it means keeping our eye on the ball, understanding what the real point of life is about, not getting sidetracked. Yes, we have things we have to do, we have appointments and schedules to keep. We have children to raise. We have jobs to go to. We have many things to do, but we have to keep our eye on what is really important, which is Christ. So you younger people, you who are children of the covenant, Members of the church because of birthright. Yes, birthright. You're learning many things. You're growing. You're developing. You're experiencing the world. Trying to find your place, how you fit. And all this is quite normal, natural. But are you bypassing? what the Lord says to you in His Word, through your parents, through those He places in your life to help you grow and develop spiritually? Are you dismissing it as, does it really relate to you anymore or yet? You know, the world, young person, is going to present you throughout your life with many lovers. Many ideas, many beliefs, many uh, experiences, situations, many lifestyles that will vie for your affection. Will you hold fast to the teaching of your mother and your father? Will you care more about the truth of God than you will how many likes that you get on Instagram or Facebook? Will you put in the time to you know, learn the, the basic building blocks of the faith so that when you are challenged, when you are confronted, you will have an answer for the one who asks you a reason for the hope that you've been brought up in? 
You take the time. Ask your pastor or your elders or someone else about uh, things that just seem to go over your head, maybe out the window, or whether it's in the sermon or, or the Sunday school lesson. We seek to find the answer. And when the time comes that you no longer answer to your mother or your father, will Christ Jesus be your Lord or someone or something else? And you adults, young adults, older adults, single adults, married adults, are you modeling before younger eyes that you are coming in awe to the Lord's goodness in these latter days? Is Christ Jesus your passion? Not just between the hours of 9.30 and 12.30. But is Christ really your passion? Is that what you're communicating to those around you? Do your children see that? Or are you keeping other lovers on the side? You know, financial portfolios, retirement plans, vacation plans, traveling hopes, things that have their place. But they can easily take the place of your love and devotion and passion for Christ. What is your passion? Will you continue to seek the Lord your God and David your king all your life, even when you retire? Or will you at one point retire from serving the Lord? And to us who are elders and deacons and and, um, maybe semi or quasi officials in servants in the church, will we continue serving Christ because He is our passion? Or is it for the praise of men and women? Will we fall into a kind of professionalism? This is, the, this is just how we are. Will Christ be our passion? Will we seek the Lord or seek our own advancement? Will we realize the privilege that we have to be used by the Lord to serve Him? Or will we get resentful because we're not getting the recognition we think we deserve? You know, the prophecy here in Hosea 3, it just it reaches down to the, even the, the tiniest fibers of life. We've been bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves. The precious blood of Christ is that price. So we serve Him, we glorify Him in these latter days. Think about it. Can it really be that we have gained an interest in our Savior's blood? That we have a part, a portion, a share, a stake, a claim in that blood that is the only thing that can pay the debt that we owe. Think of God has poured forth His amazing love on us, His people. He's reclaimed and He has remarried us who were slaves of sin and of misery. We thought we had it good, but we lived in filth, spiritual filth. Price that could be paid. Only Christ Jesus could do that. Christ paid a much higher price than 15 shekels of silver and nine bushels of barley. He paid an infinite price. And so now no longer do you live without king or prince, without the means of grace, without divine guidance. You have it in Christ and in His Word. We adulterers and adulteresses, we have been reclaimed by Christ. And so, if you're not, 
be reclaimed by Christ in these last days, in these latter days, and then see and behold the goodness of the Lord. The Lord our God who has truly reclaimed us with an infinite price by the shed blood of your Son, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we've looked at this account of the prophet's restoration to his wayward wife. May it capture our hearts and our attention. May it ultimately point us to Christ. Fill us with an awe that does bring us trembling with joy and and with reverence into your presence every Lord's day as we delight to praise you for the goodness that you have given to us how you've made us your own. Lord, can it truly be that we have gained a share and interest in our Savior's blood, in that price of redemption? Have we been bought and covered with His cleansing blood? May you bring those who are outside Christ into the family as you enlighten minds, as you renew wills, as you take away that heart of stone and give a heart of flesh that will respond preaching of the gospel and the truth of your word. And do it all, O Lord, for the honor and glory of your name. For we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen and amen.